Welcome back to my YouTube channel, guys. My name is Prince Lari, and this is True Crime and Chill. Welcome, hi, if you are new here, my name is Prince Study, and this is where I come to tell you about some of the most shocking true crime cases that happened in South Africa. So if you would like to chill with me every week, if you want to hear from me every week to see what kind of case I have for you, I would highly suggest that you press that subscribe button, that you like the video, and also comment down below what you think, if you think something else could be done, if you think there's more to the case that me than meets the eye, if you think... There's something that the police could have missed or anyone could have missed for that matter. Just go ahead and put it down in the comment section and let me know what you think. I would love to have your support. But for those of you who are not new here, thank you for coming back and watching me again. So yeah, without any further ado, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you about the kind of case that I have for you today. This week's case, I'm bringing you another family murder case. And if you remember... From my very first true crime case, I also talked about another, another family murder. It was the Van Broda family murders case. If you haven't checked it out, I would really, really recommend that you go and check it out. It's really interesting on its own. It'll have you asking yourself a lot of questions and just, you know, trying to see if something could have come out of it. But do go and check it out. I promise you, you will not be disappointed. But yeah, we are dealing with another family murder case, but this one is, is a bit different. And by different, I mean this one is messed up. Okay, this is, it's really frustrating. You're going to get very frustrated as, you, as we go on in the video. Um, but yeah, it's another family murder case, but it's a bit different from the one that I've done before. And another different thing about this one is that I'm going to split it into two parts. This is the first part of the video. I'm going to upload the next part this coming week on Monday. So yeah, this one is a bit too long. So do stay tuned for the second part that's going to be coming again on Monday. But yeah, let me just go ahead and get into it. Today's case is about the Lauder family murders. And it involves the two children of the family, namely um, Nicolette Lauder and Horace Slaughter. And they were accused of murdering their own parents in July 19th of 2008. So yeah, like I said, it's a bit different from the one that I covered before, but this one is a lot more messier. So you got to get ready for this one. Now, Horace was the younger sibling who was 20 years old at the time of the case. And his older sister, Nicolette, was 26 years old. They were the kids of Johannes and Ricky Lauder, and the family lived in Westville, Durban. Johannes was an engineer working for, for an international company, and his wife, Ricky, was a teacher. They met in university at the University of, of Pochestrum, and when they met, Johannes was a, or rather, let's call him Johnny, because his nickname was Johnny. So we're going to call him Johnny every time we mention him in the video. So Johnny was a was a math tutor at the university when him and Ricky met. And it just so happened that Ricky needed some extra lessons in the subject. So they spent a lot of time together and they ended up um, dating each other. And they dated for one year until they got married in 1981. Then on April 15th of 1982, they had their first child, Nicolette. And even though they were happy to have their first daughter together, they couldn't really spend a lot of time with her because they were still students at the time and they were both still working. So I think anyone who is a student and is working at the same time, they would attest to the fact that it's very difficult to find a lot of time for anything else. So for the first few years of Nicolette's life, they couldn't really spend a lot of time with her because they had so much going on. But when they finally got to you know, get, get done with their studies, then they managed to, you know, have a lot of time for her and life went on. So in 1986, they had their second daughter. Her name is Christelle, but I'm not going to talk about Christelle in the case. I just wanted to mention her because um, Christelle had no involvement in this. So we're not going to talk about Christelle. We're going to talk about Nicolette and her younger brother, Hardis. Hardis was born two years after Crystal was born. So Hardis was born in 1988. So you do remember that I said that um, this case involved Hardis and, and Nicolette Lauder being the ones who were accused of um, killing their parents, right? Well, there's a, there's a third person 
involved in this case. And his name was Matthew Naidu. And Matthew was said to be the one who was really the mastermind behind this whole thing. And what's so strange about Matthew is the fact that he proclaimed himself to be the third son of God. And something else that I forgot to mention earlier is that this case was described to um, show a little bit of some cult-like behaviors in it. So now that I'm talking about someone who's who proclaimed himself to be the third son of God, I think you can tell where this is about to go. So Matthew was the mastermind behind the whole thing. So Matthew got himself involved in the lives of um, Nicolette, Nicolette Lauter and, and Horace Lauter. And when he did, he spent an entire year trying to convince them that their parents were in the way of his godly mission, his holy mission that was given to him by God. That was his whole idea, that he, he was the third son of God who had a holy mission that was given to him by God so he can carry it out on earth. And when he met Nicolette and Horace, he convinced them that indeed he was the son of God and their parents were in the way. And I guess his antics worked, his scheme worked, because at the end of it all, they ended up killing their own parents. He was so persuasive and so manipulative that when both Nicolette and Horace look back on this, they just say that, you know what, they just couldn't think for themselves. They couldn't think straight whenever this guy was around. And they just, they were not rational at all. They couldn't be rational. There was no rational thinking. Whatever he said went. And that's how persuasive and manipulative he was and controlling as well. And even when they were committing the crimes, they just couldn't really let it click onto their heads so that, okay, listen, we're actually killing our own parents because of this guy. That's how persuasive, manipulative, and controlling Matthew was. Another thing that I should have mentioned was that Matthew ended up being um, Nicolette's fiance. And they both met in 2007 in February. And when they met, they met during a difficult time in Nicolette's life. It was said that Nicolette was dealing with a lot of mental health issues and she was dealing with schizophrenia. So when they met, she was at a very vulnerable point in her life and she was actually dealing with schizophrenia. She's been dealing with it since her teenage years. So when I got to find out about that part, I was like, okay, maybe that's how it ended up, it ended up being so easy for Matthew to gain control over her life because she wasn't really, you know, in her best state mentally to to think for herself or to be rational about anything but i don't know you could disagree with me on that but if you do do let me know what you think but i think maybe that's how he got to have that kind of control that we're going to talk about over her life and when they met matthew was just 20 years old he was a few years younger than nicolette but this didn't seem to be a problem because they did you know have a really you know, they, they had some sort of connection. They ended up connecting with each other and they texted a lot with each other when they first met. So the age thing didn't seem to be really much of a problem between them, even though Nicolette was a few years older than Matthew. And it wasn't long before Matthew started planting ideas in Nicolette's head that he had some religious powers and he was the third son of God. And it was said that Nicolette was a, was, was a very religious person. As a matter of fact, she was more religious than anyone else in her family. And so when she heard that Matthew had these religious powers and he was this son of God, she got, a, she got more and more interested in hearing what, what he had to say. So this was sort of a bonus as well for Matthew that he came across a woman who was so deeply religious that she was willing to to hear him out on his claims of having these, these religious powers. And every time Matthew mentioned these powers of his, she got even more hooked into him. She got even more interested in him. And they ended up having their own relationship. But their relationship wasn't really all sunshine and rainbows. It wasn't, it wasn't nice at all. As a matter of fact, Nicolette suffered a lot of abuse, mental, verbal, and physical abuse at the hands of Matthew. And every time Matthew did this to, to her, he would go on to say that it's her holy punishment. She had to be punished. She had to be cleansed. And when it comes to the verbal abuse, he would say things like she wasn't worthy to be with someone of his class, someone who was the son of God. And because of that, she had to be punished. So she suffered a lot from this guy. It wasn't really a perfect relationship. 
And now you can tell the kind of guy that Matthew is. And every time when he has these outbursts, every time after he calls her damaged goods, every time after he calls her unworthy, every time after he pretty much tries to diminish her worth in any way, he would blame his outbursts on these three certain beings who lived inside of him. He said that he had three spiritual beings who lived inside of him. So whenever he would beat her up, whenever he would insult her, whenever he would humiliate her, he would say that it wasn't him who's doing these things. It would be one of his spiritual beings that would take over his body during those moments. So, hey, we now we cannot blame him. It wasn't him. It was the spiritual beings. That's, that's what Matthew said. Matthew lived in Phoenix and Nicolette lived with her parents in Westville. And between Phoenix and Westville, it's quite a drive. And Nicolette had a car at this point. So whenever she had to see Matthew, she would have to drive all the way to Phoenix. But they ended up getting very tired of that. And she was also getting exhausted. And the fact that she had to spend a lot of money on fuel just to go see him. Matthew took this as an opportunity to say to her, listen, why don't we move in together? Why don't we live together? But at this point, Nicolette didn't have her own house. She was still living with her parents. So the only way for them to live together was for Matthew to go and live with Nicolette in her parents' house. That's the idea that he came up with. Listen, let me come and live with you in, West, in, in Westville. But Nicolette knew that her parents would never agree to this. And another thing that she was worried about was the fact that Matthew was Indian and she's white. So she was worried that her parents might have some reservations of their own about her dating someone outside of her race. And even though they wouldn't say it out loud, she still had that concern that, okay, listen, I bring you to my parents' house, you, and they wouldn't really expect me to date someone like you. So it would be a bit difficult. So what she ended up doing was she snuck him into their house and Matthew was living in her room and they had no idea. If her parents noticed Matthew was in the house, they would just act as if like Matthew was visiting because they knew about Matthew. And they, even though they weren't really 100% behind the relationship, they still allowed it to go on. Um, they knew about Matthew and whenever they saw him in the house, they thought he was visiting. But at evening, when they go to bed, Matthew would just go sleep in Nicolette's room. It turns out that Matthew wasn't having this idea of them living together just so they can be closer together. No, he was having these ideas just so he can gain some control over Nicolette's life. He wanted to have a certain amount of control in her life and he wanted to make sure that everything that she did, he knew about. And everything that happened in her life, he knew about. And it went as far as him going to the point of controlling her finances. Nicolette was working at this point. She had a job at a, at a local bar and another thing that she did was she formed a band with a couple of her, of her friends, a music band. And it was a very successful music band, so they also made some money from that. And Matthew wanted to have control of her, over her finances. And because Nicolette grew up in a, in a traditional family that believed that the man was the one who was supposed to be in charge of finances, she allowed Matthew to gain access to her, to her bank cards, have her bank pins. And, you know, so at this point, she couldn't make any financial decision without Matthew knowing. And so his plan worked. He ended up having some form of control in, in her life. But even though Nicolette's parents had their own concerns about Matthew, um, Nicolette's brother, Horus, felt differently about him. As a matter of fact, he got to find out that him and Matthew had a common interest in cartoons and wrestling. And because of this, they had their own little bond that they formed on the side. But I really don't think it was very much genuine on Matthew's side because he ended up recruiting Horace into this little mission of his, his holy mission that he had from God. And because of this, things ended up turning sideways very quickly. And it was said that because of this bond that they formed in the beginning, even when Horace found out that Matthew was secretly living in the house, in Nicolette's, in Nicolette's room, he assured them both that he was going to keep their secret. He wasn't going to tell their parents and they had nothing to worry about. Now, what sucks is that he, he didn't really know. If only he knew the kind of abuse that his sister suffered at the hands of this guy. So, But he never knew. And because of this, he just said, you know what? It's fine. Listen, your secret's safe with me. I'm not going to tell the parents. I'm not going to tell the parents about any of this. 
So it's okay, don't worry about it. So remember I mentioned that Nicolette formed a band, created a band with a couple of her friends? Well, yeah, the band was really successful. It was well known in that time and they made some money from their gigs. Unfortunately, this didn't last very long, especially when Matthew came into the picture because Matthew ruined a lot of things for them. He got in the way of a lot of their gigs, a lot of their deals, and this happened when Nicolette had this idea that Matthew should be their manager. And this was a terrible mistake because he ruined a lot of things for them. So much so that they were not getting a lot of gigs anymore and they were getting a bad reputation and the band ended up breaking apart because of Matthew. So that's how much he was starting to ruin her life. And you know, it's really unfortunate that it happened like that because... You know, it, the band was so good that at some point there was a, a man who came forth and approached Nicolette and told her that he was working for a record, a record label company in Johannesburg and he wanted to give Nicolette's band a chance to show him what, they, what they've got. And if they were really that good, you can imagine the kind of success that they were going to have at this. But Matthew got jealous of that and he ended up being aggressive towards Nicolette and this man and the deal ended up not happening. So that's how much he ruined things for her. Imagine the kind of success that they would have had if they were that good and then they ended up having this record label deal. He just ruined it. He ruined everything he touched in her life. But she couldn't see that because she was so in love with him. Now things got to a point where Matthew started believing that, you know what, Nicolette is drawing a bit too much attention to herself. As a matter of fact, she was too good looking. And because of this, he forced her to cut her own hair. He forced her to cut her hair and he forced her to get rid of her, of her clothes, the good looking clothes that she had because he believed that she was attracting too much attention to herself and he didn't want any guy to be approaching her. So that's how, so that's the kind of snake that Matthew was. It's just a piece of trash and he controlled her life in every aspect. And so he did this, he forced her to cut down her own hair, he forced her to get rid of her clothes, and that's just how twisted he was. Wait, that's not all. That is not all. That's not all he did. Because this one that I'm about to tell you is the worst that he actually did. He went as far as saying that her parents were evil beings sent from the devil to distract them on their holy mission that they were given by God. He said that her parents were evil messengers from the devil, and you would think that when it, when it came to this point, when it came to her parents, Nicola would just say, you know what, this is the final straw. You are not about to do that. No, she didn't really try to fight him on this. But he went on to say that he'd say things like whenever, whenever Nicolette's mother would suggest that she get some therapy for her mental health issues, he would say that, no, listen, that's not really her caring about you. She's just trying to control you. She's just trying to ruin your life because she's really a messenger from the devil. So don't try to do anything that she tells you. So that's how much manipulative he was being. He was just, he was also trying to turn her against her own parents. Now that Matthew had this control over Nicolette, it was time for him to set his eyes on brainwashing her brother Hardis. And so finally they revealed to Hardis who Matthew really was, or who, who he sold himself out to be. And when he heard that Matthew is the third son of God, who was here on a holy mission to cleanse the world, he was really surprised by this. But because he saw that his sister believed in him, believed everything that Matthew said, and she reassured Hardis that, yeah, it's the truth, Hardis did fall for this. He ended up believing them, and he ended up joining the little group, the little cult, um, the little crusade or whatever you may call it. And he ended up believing that, okay, he really is the son of God sent here to try to cleanse the world. And yes, our parents are evil beings sent from the devil to try to ruin our lives and to try to control us. So now he was starting to sink his claws into Nicolette's younger brother. And she let this happen. Matthew said that the reason his parents were now evil beings sent from hell, sent by the devil, he said that the reason behind this was because they were abused as babies, even though they don't remember it. So they were abused as babies, and now they turned into these evil beings, and so now they are going to try to ruin the lives of Nicolette and 
and hardest. And as Matthew gained more and more control over both siblings' lives, now he wasn't only abusing Nicolette, he went over to physically abuse her little brother as well. So now he was abusing both of them physically. Every time he did this, he would just tell them that it was his holy punishment. And you know, I cannot even believe that this, this happened while Nicolette was around. I mean, sure, I get that she was in love with this guy, but when someone gets to now abuse your little brother, wouldn't you even try to do something about it? You know, but she never did anything about it. That's just how I feel about it. But yes, now it happened like that. And he went on to abuse her brother as well, physically claiming that this is their holy punishment that they had to get. He got to control their social lives as well. They got to cut out a lot of their friends and Hardis didn't really have a lot of friends. So his small circle of friends, Matthew managed to get rid of as well and to get rid of his social media. So now they were cut out from the rest of the world. They were isolated. And this was, this was just his plan to make sure that they, there was nothing and no one who could try to, you know, wake them up from his manipulative game that he was playing. So now it was just him and the siblings and he had the most control in that um, circle of theirs that they had. Remember that Matthew broke up Nicolette's band, right? And when this happened, she now had only one source of income, which was from the job that she had at the local bar. And this meant that she had to take a lot of shifts. Anything that came up, she had to grab with both hands just so she can make some money out of it. And this meant that she had to spend a lot of time at the bar and Matthew wasn't really a fan of that idea. So when Nicolette took up a lot of shifts, he went to the bar all the time. He was at the bar all the time, stalking her, trying to see who came up to her, who spoke to her. And whenever a man would try to approach her and talk to her, even if it was just a customer, he would harass them, he would get aggressive. And so it got to a point where um, Nicolette ended up losing her job at the bar just because of Matthew, because he kept on harassing customers. So again, this guy just burned down everything that he touched in her life. He ruined everything. So now that Nicolette lost her job and they now had no source of income, Matthew turned his attention to Hardis. Hardis was getting an allowance from his parents at that time. And Matthew manipulated him into letting him have control over his finances as well. So now he was controlling his social life, his mind, and also his finances. So he kept on scamming money out of Hardis as much as he can. And then at a certain point, Matthew saw a poster about a job that was available at a local coffee shop. And so he saw this as an opportunity to prove his, um, his powers, his supernatural or spiritual powers that he had to Nicolette. And he went on to Nicolette and told her that, listen, I had a prophecy. And in my prophecy, I saw you having a job. And then he ended up telling her about the job at the local coffee shop. And then when Nicolette went to go get the job, she felt so grateful. And she actually um, gave credit to Matthew that if it wasn't for him, she wouldn't have gotten the job. And that was Matthew's plan all along, to sink his teeth even deeper in her by making her think that, okay, this guy really has some spiritual powers. He saw me getting a job and now I got the job. So she thought that the only reason she could have gotten that job was because of him. And that was his plan the entire time. In November of 2007, the Lauder family planned a vacation. They wanted to go take a vacation. And Hardis was very excited about this. He wanted to go with them. But Nicolette couldn't go because of her new job at the coffee shop. But when, Ma when Matthew found out that Hardis wanted to leave with his parents on this vacation, he ended up telling him that he couldn't go on the vacation because they had a lot to do. They had a mission to carry out. And so he couldn't just up and leave. And Hardis ended up staying behind, even though he had no idea what this mission was. He still had no idea what this holy mission that they had to do was. So he ended up staying behind. He ended up not going with this family on the vacation. So now it was just Johnny and his wife, Ricky. But the kids were both left at the house. But now when it was just the, uh, the three of them at the house, um, Matthew had this idea that they had to start their holy training. And this training mostly involved Nicolette and Hardis kneeling down for hours, praying to Matthew and praying for their holy mission. 
it was just him. Actually, it was just him telling them what to do. And it, whatever they did all the time, it would, trust me, it wouldn't be nice. It wouldn't be something that they enjoyed, like kneeling down for hours to pray while they're praying to Matthew and praying for their holy mission, praying to him as if he's the God. So that's the kind of training that he wanted to do um, with them. So they did everything, and I mean everything, that this guy told them to do. Whatever it was, however crazy it sounded, they did everything that he said. It was almost like they were in his cult. It was like a cult of three people. So they did absolutely everything he told them to do. So now when it seemed like he finally had enough control over the siblings, that's when he brought up the idea that it's time for their parents to die. And at first, the siblings were not very confident in this idea. They were really shocked by it. But as Matthew kept on talking even more, as he got even more persuasive, more manipulative, as he kept on telling them about how evil their parents are and how much they are evil beings from, from the devil, they ended up being on board with his plan because he kept on insisting that this is a holy mission that they had to carry out from God himself. So, and this was a religious family. They grew up believing deeply in God and Nicolette more than Hardis because she was even more religious. So Hardis followed, followed her lead and they ended up being on board with this plan that, okay, yeah, both Johnny and Ricky had to die. You would think that this would have been the final straw for them. Like when they heard this guy say, okay, listen, your parents have to die. You would think that they would finally wake up and be like, okay, whoa, we have done a lot of things that you've told us to do. But this one, this is absolutely insane. But it worked on them. So since the parents were gone, and they were gone for a very long time because they only came back in January. Since the parents were gone on a vacation, Matthew decided to take this as an opportunity to go over their finances. And remember, this was a very successful family. I mean, the dad was an engineer and working for an international company, and the mother was a teacher. So, of course, they had some money on them. So, Matthew started to look over their finances, trying to look at their terms of life insurance. He tried to see what kind of assets they had. So, he wanted to see how much money he would make out of them dying. So, he was just looking for an opportunity to make a lot of money because he wanted to live a very soft life. He didn't want to work. He believed that working was for slaves and he didn't want to do any of it. He just wanted to have things handed over to him. So this was an opportunity for him to make a lot of money. When the parents got back in January, Matthew was not really happy about this because this meant that he had to go back into hiding because they still had no idea that this guy was living with their daughter in her room. So he had to go back into hiding to make sure that he's not found out. And when they came back, he got aggressive even more and he kept on abusing Nicolette even further because of this. And it got to a point where Nicolette ended up losing her job at the coffee shop as well. So yeah, that's how bad it got. All because he was mad that their parents were now back from their vacation. Now that they lost another source of income, which was the job that Nicolette had at, at the coffee shop, Matthew came up with the idea that they should now start stealing money from their dad. And what they decided to do was they were going to steal Johnny's credit card and they were going to steal his PIN number as well. And they did this. They managed to get his PIN number. They managed to get his credit card. And they first withdrew 2,000 rand from his credit card. And when he noticed that money had been taken out of his account, he confronted Nicolette and Horace about it. And they just told him that maybe your account was hacked. That's what they said to him. Like, okay, maybe your account was hacked. This happens all the time. And he believed them. But then when it happened for the second time, he got worried. He went to, to change his credit card and he went to change his pen. And then it happened again for the third time when he came back with his new credit card and his, and his new pen. And what happened was they stole the, the credit card while it was still in the envelope along with the new pen that he had. And they withdrew another 2,000 rand from his account. So they stole a total of 6,000 from Johnny's account every time they withdrew 2,000 rands. So when it happened for the third time, that's when Johnny decided to go to the police and let them know that, okay, listen, someone's stealing money out of my credit card. It's the third time now, 
and I even changed my PIN and my credit card, but still, money is missing out of my account. Money's been taken out of my account. And when this happened, the detective who was helping him out on the case went on to go get the footage from the ATM, the camera footage from the ATM where the money was being withdrawn for him. And when they looked at the footage, they got to see that the person who was using his card covered the face up and they couldn't really see who this person was. But the hoodie that this person was wearing looked very familiar, but Johnny just couldn't put his finger on who it belonged to for a fact. But he could see that this hoodie, I've seen this before, I've seen it somewhere before, I know it from somewhere, but I just cannot tell exactly who it belongs to. As they looked at the footage even more, Johnny got to notice that in the parking lot near the, the ATM, he could see his daughter's car. He could see Nicolette's green Uno right in that parking lot. And when he told the detective about this, the detective believed that it was too much of a coincidence. And there's got to be some story behind it. There's got to be a motive why that car was there. He believed that Nicolette was the one who stole his father's, her father's credit card and she went on to withdraw the money from, from that ATM. And when they talked about it, the detective ended up saying, okay, listen, if I arrest her and she's found guilty, she will have a criminal record. So do you want me to arrest her or are you gonna handle it yourself? And when Johnny thought about this, he thought that if he got her arrested and she was found guilty, she would have her future ruined. And so because it was his daughter, he decided that he would handle it himself and he decided not to get her arrested. And maybe he wanted to give her a chance to learn a lesson from this. Maybe he planned to teach her a lesson on his own. So he didn't get her arrested. So you, you cannot really blame her, blame him for that. Johnny went back home and he confronted his kids about this and he confronted even Matthew about it as well. And they denied that they were stealing his money. They said that they were only in that parking lot because they went to the mall to, to watch movies. So that was their story and they stuck behind it. And then he decided to just hide his credit cards in his workplace instead of keeping them in his house. But now that they couldn't steal Johnny's money anymore, they, Matthew had this idea that now they had to steal from, um, from Ricky, from, Nic from Nicolette and Hardis' mother. So he told Hardis to steal his mother's handbag and they decided to sell her phone. And then they threw her handbag on the other side of, of, of town so that it would seem as if like someone came and stole the handbag and took the phone out of the handbag. So when, when Ricky, Nicolette and Hardis' mother found out about this, found out that her phone had been stolen and her, and her purse was missing as well, she freaked out because it was in the house and so she thought someone had come into the house and stole her handbag and then took her phone. And to me, it really, I found it really strange. I was like, look, you live in a house that is very well secured and it has an alarm system on and you never heard anything, but you think someone came in and took your purse took your handbag and took the phone and left. And if really someone came in to break into your house, don't you think they could have stolen anything else? They could have taken the TV, they could have taken anything that they could take to go sell, but instead, they, but instead they only took your handbag. But she couldn't see it at that point. She couldn't think that her kids could have been behind this. She couldn't think that her daughter's boyfriend could have been behind this. But now they, decide, they decided to, to stop with the stealing for a bit. And it was time to put Matthew's plan in action. His plan to, to kill both Johnny and his wife, Ricky. And when he came up with this plan, he decided to go buy a burner phone. The first thing that he was going to do was he was going to send threatening messages to, to Ricky and, and Johnny. And he did this so that the, the messages couldn't be traced back to him. And to prove that he really did think about this, he thought about this plan through and through, he got Hardis and Nicolette to go to their parents and say that they got beaten up by some random guys who attacked them and they said that these guys somehow knew who they were. And to make sure that Ricky and Johnny believed their kids when they told them this, Matthew got to beat up Nicolette and Hardis to make it seem like they had bruises from, from the attack. So he was really 
thinking about this like he wasn't trying to be reckless about it he wanted to make sure that it looked really believable so he went on to beat them up to make sure that um, their parents will buy the story now both Johnny and Ricky were getting scared for the lives of their kids and it got to a point where they were even receiving threatening letters Matthew was was forging some letters and he made them seem like they were some man who was angry at Johnny that Johnny was having an affair with his wife and now Matthew was trying to cause a rift or tension between between Johnny and his wife and of course um, Johnny denied that he was having any affair he had no idea what these letters what these letters were talking about but the seed of doubt was already being planted in Ricky's head she was already starting to believe that her husband was having an affair so now Matthew didn't only plan to to kill them he also planned to ruin their marriage he decided to go to the police again and they went to the very same detective who helped out Johnny with his credit card case and and his name is Detective Duma I know I didn't mention him before and Detective Duma wasn't really confident that he would catch these people just based on some letters and untraceable messages that they got so he did say that he was going to look over the evidence that they brought to him whatever they brought whatever information they gave to him he did say that okay listen i'm going to look into it but i'm not really sure you should get your hopes up that we're ever going to catch these people the detective actually believed that it could have been a prank even though you and i know that it wasn't a prank it was matthew carrying out his murder plan but the detective thought that this could have been a prank of some kind from some kids who were just trying to you know be who were just trying to be naughty so he didn't really believe that he could end up catching these people but even though the detective thought it was some kind of a prank the company that Johnny worked for ended up knowing about this and they took some drastic actions they went on to hire a private investigator to try to find out who these people could be that are threatening the the family of Johnny Lauder and this was because that since this company was an international company they a lot of their executive members were being kidnapped and being held at ransom and because of this they thought that this was now happening in South Africa and so they thought that they could hire a private investigator to try to find out who this person could have been who was threatening the lives of Ricky and his entire family even though Johnny and Ricky were trying to find out who this person was it never came into their minds that Matthew could have been behind this and yes they got some very weird feelings from Matthew they got some very weird vibes from him but it never got into their heads that this could have been him who was behind everything but at some point Matthew raised enough suspicion to Johnny that Johnny ended up deciding to do some investigating on his own into into Matthew and what he did was he went on to do some digging into Matthew's past and he tried to find out who Matthew was and the purpose of his investigation was to try to see if Matthew had done some criminal activity in his past he wanted to see if maybe he had some sort of a criminal record in his name but he couldn't really find out anything like that but what he did find out was that Matthew lied about his studies and he lied a lot about the things that he did about his his work history his studies and he just made himself out to be this perfect guy this smart guy that he really wasn't but he couldn't find the one thing that he wanted to find which was a criminal record or a criminal activity of some kind that Matthew was tied to when Ricky also found out that Matthew was lying about these kind of things she got fed up with him so much so that she called detective Duma to come to their house so that she can confront Matthew and instruct him to leave her house and never come back as she did this Matthew got very defensive about it and he went on to accuse Ricky of being racist um, he said that she didn't like the fact that her daughter was dating someone outside of their race and she didn't like the fact that Matthew is Indian so she accused so she, he accused her of being um, of being racist and of course she denied these claims but as this was happening um, Nicolette came to Matthew's rescue and she said that listen if he's leaving then I'm also leaving if he's not welcome in this house then I'm also leaving and I'm never coming back of course Ricky was devastated to see that her own daughter would 
choose someone else over her own family, that she would go on to choose her boyfriend over um, her own family. But as a matter of fact, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that, that Matthew and, and Nicolette ended up being engaged. So she wasn't, so he wasn't really her boyfriend at this point. He was her fiance, but I don't know if her parents knew about it or maybe they did it, you know, in secret. But when I researched about it, I got to find out that Matthew was actually her fiance and not really her boyfriend. So her mother was still devastated at the thought that her daughter would just up and leave her entire family just because of this guy. And as she was trying to plead with her to not do this, Nicolette was packing her things. She was packing everything she owned and she put it in her car and she was just getting ready to leave because Matthew was being kicked out of the house. So as time went on, in June of 2008, Nicolette and Matthew got an apartment of their own. And they were excited about this because now it meant they had a lot of freedom from Nicolette's parents. But this didn't mean that things were going to get any better between the two of them. As a matter of fact, the, the abuse still went on and Matthew even stole from his own fiance, from Nicolette. And he stole some equipment that she had bought and he sold it at a pawn shop. So things weren't really getting better just because now they had a new apartment. He still didn't give a damn about her. So during this time, Nicolette's parents were very worried about her. As a matter of fact, they wanted her to come back home and they sent Hodders to, to the apartment to try to talk to her, to try to talk her into coming back home to, to her family. And when Hodders came, the three of them took this as an opportunity to really plan again the murders of Ricky and Johnny. And now they had a plan that, okay, listen, Nicolette is going to go back. She's going to agree to go back to the house. And when she did this, um, Matthew was going to sneak back in a few days later after that so they can carry out their plan. Now it was now or never. That's what they thought. It was now or never. The parents had to die. And Matthew went on to say that, listen, I'll kill them myself. You guys just help me make sure that it actually happens, but I'll be the one who kills your parents. So it was now or never. Now they really had to set their plan in motion. And Matthew went on to say that he will be the one who kills their parents. All they had to do was just make sure that he, like they back him up when he, when he does it. When he finally kills them, they got to back him up to make sure that everything goes according to plan. And he wanted to make sure that they make it seem as if like they died of, of natural causes. So they came up with a, with a couple of attempts, with a couple of attempts to carry out their plan. And I'm going to talk about them in the next part of the video because I'm going to end the first part here. But when I continue again, I'm, I'm going to tell you guys about the attempts that they decided to go with. And I'm going to let you know if they worked or if they didn't work. Um, but yeah, for now... This is at the end of the first part of the case. Thank you for making it to the end of the video. Stay tuned for the next part that I'm going to upload this coming week. And you're going to get to see the end of this entire story. And trust me, you are not ready for the things that I'm about to tell you. So yeah, I will see you next week. I will post again next week the second part of the video, which is coming either on Monday or on Tuesday. So, and thank you for chilling with me and listening to me tell you about this case. It's not the end of it though, because there's a lot of it. There's still a lot that I have to tell you. So be ready for the second part and be ready to be shocked even more than you are now, if you got to be shocked. So I'm Prince Luddy. I will see you guys again next week. Enjoy the rest of your weekend and yeah, have a great one.